inshallah, and you are in lesson one. While everybody's filling this out, I just want to give everyone a quick reminder that when you are attending these sessions, inshallah, we want these sessions to become something that doesn't impact you today, tomorrow, next week, this semester, this year, your time in Sheffield, or rather, a lifetime. And in order for us to do this, we need to learn with the idea that first, before everything else, you're applying what we're learning to yourselves. Before you think about anybody else, we're thinking about ourselves and how we can apply what we're learning to you immediately. Then secondly, we start imagining how we can pass this information on to somebody else. And if you're sitting in a gathering and you are told that you need to tell the same information that I'm giving you to a friend, to a father, to another audience, to the auditorium next to us, what will you guys be doing? You'll be taking notes. Probably be, if you're cheeky, you'll be recording what I'm saying and then play it back to everybody else. Or you'll be taking notes. And part of your concentration in this class will be to take notes and inshallah next week we should have the workbooks for you ready. We'll have places to make notes. Then your duty will be to bring a pen and write things down. Also, we need to make sure we don't get distracted. So mobile phones, only when the QR codes are required, bring them out inshallah. And importantly, try your best to be consistent with these sessions. How many times have you actually started something in life and ended it without being forced to? You have no choice but to go to year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, GCSEs, A-levels. You didn't really have a choice. You started it and you ended it. And now you've obligated upon yourself to go to university and inshallah you'll start it and you'll end it. But how many times did you attend an Islamic circle and you started it from the beginning and you stayed all the way till the end. Either you can't count them on your fingers or you've never attended an Islamic circle. And if you want the most out of these circles, out of any circle in life, especially when it comes to Islamic ones, then try your best to block everything else out for the next hour and a half every Tuesday, 7 to 8.30. So you can attend these, start it from the beginning, completed to the end as well. And two more requests. First one is ask yourself why you're here. We had this conversation briefly last week. You're not here for me to tell silly jokes that don't make sense and only I laugh at. You're not here to just look at me in the clothes I'm wearing, my nice shoes. But you're here to reflect on your own self and to build a closer relationship with Allah beyond everything else. If you can remind yourself of this fact at the beginning of every lesson, then inshallah you'll make the most out of this. And the last point is common sense. But when we're leaving the room, can we leave in an orderly, quiet fashion? And since the ladies are closer to the door, let's allow them to leave first, then the brothers can go. And if this doesn't work well tonight, then I might need to become like a strict this row you guys go first, and then that row you guys go. I might have to do this, but inshallah, I'm hoping we have good, sane, heartful adults that we can do this session in peace with. Can I just make one last request? Anybody who hasn't registered, can you please just scan that code? It should take you 23 seconds. Just put everything down and submit, and then we'll start our lesson, inshallah. Today's lesson is still an introduction and we want to understand where the heart is in our life, in existence and we need to understand the psychology of purpose and change. And in order to do this I want to make a point very very clear to everyone so I need you all to scan the Slido's QR, QR code and I'm going to ask a question, I'm going to give you three options. And if you had the, the choice to begin teaching one of the following after the next, after the next, 
which order would you choose? Just click on whichever one and submit. And we'll have a discussion about the order once everybody has submitted. So you have the option of spirituality, Quran, or teaching Islamic laws and Islamic rulings. Which one would you do first? And which one would you do last? says in the Quran, كَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فِيكُمْ رَسُولًا مِنْكُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِنَا We sent between you a messenger from amongst you who recites upon you from our verses. وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ So Allah he sent a messenger and he sent with him a book. And through the book, the first thing that Allah mentions that He will do is وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ Tazkiyah is the name of our course. Spirituality is the name of our course. Purification is the definition of Tazkiyah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the first point of protocol will be that purification process, that spirituality process. Before you understand the book, before you understand the rulings, before you get any form of beneficial knowledge. Allah, He began with the element of Tazkiyah. We are defining Tazkiyah as spirituality and as purification. But we'll go into a more depth, more in-depth definition in a few slides. Allah tells us in the Quran, when He wants to make a statement to us and makes us pay attention to something, Allah will swear by something. Can anybody give me an example? والعصر والليل والضحى والشمس that's the one I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he makes an oath about something he's not focusing on the oath itself Allah is making the oath about something but then the sentence that comes later is the focal point of the conversation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says an asr he, he, he swears by the time and then he says the very man is in loss except those who do good deed and so on so the focus is the last ayah in that surah. In Surah Al-Shams, Allah does not make one oath. According to some scholars, Allah makes 11 oaths. Allah, He says, وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا That when Allah talks about the sun and its radiance, وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا And the moon as it follows the sun. وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا And the day when it reveals itself. وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا And the night when it conceals itself. And the sky and who built it? Allah is the one who built it. And the earth and Allah is the one that spread it out. And a soul and Allah has proportioned it. And Allah He inspired it with goodness, it with evil, and Allah inspired it with righteousness. All of these are oaths that Allah is making to make one point. That the one who takes care of that soul, takes care of that heart, will be the one who has attained success. And the one who corrupts that soul and corrupts that heart, then they have fallen and they have lost. Now imagine this conversation like you were looking at the universe. Allah talks about the sun and you look at the sun and you spend a good two years looking at the sun and investigating it. Then you spend another two years just investigating the radiance of the sun. Then the moon, then the sky, then the earth, and then yourself. Then the wickedness that you see around you, and then the righteousness you see around you. And then after all of that, you come to the conclusion that verily the one who takes care of their soul and their heart will be the one who attains success. And the one who doesn't will be the one who is falling short, who will be corrupt within themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nowhere else in the Quran, does he go through so many oaths to make a point except when it came to purification of yourself? I gave you seven points last week as to why this topic is important. 
But greater than those seven points is when Allah makes an oath and then Allah makes a statement. So now we've understood the importance. Then Allah's Prophet وسلم, tells us the hadith, I think we narrated it last week too. And he tells us that verily in your body there's a, a morsel of flesh that if it is good, if it is corrupt and the rest of it is corrupt, and if it's good and the rest of it is good, and verily it is the heart. If you remember, we spoke about the king. We're still recording. The king, if it's corrupt, then everything else is corrupt. If the king is just, then everything else is just. And the king of us is our heart, stroke, our soul. If I was to ask you in one word, how would you define spirituality? I need at least 50 answers up here. Seeing a lot of connection. God consciousness, spirituality, psychological feelings, trust, good, taqwa, peace, connection. Can somebody just do me the favor and get me at least the fifty? The point I want to make is spirituality is not having that fuzzy feeling inside of being in the sky somewhere while you're on the ground. It is not the guy who smokes that beautiful joint that goes into, mashallah, different stratosphere. Spirituality is defined by removing negative beliefs, negative perceptions, negative mindsets, and instilling and developing positive beliefs, positive perceptions, and positive mindsets. And in this process, what you do is you change the inside of yourself. I don't mean take out the organs and wash them. You change the inward part of yourself being your soul and your heart, which is then manifested in your outward actions in front of the people. I'm going to give you a case study. In the 1920s, in the US, they decided let us ban alcohol. It's causing problems in the homes of people. There's a lot of gang violence on the street. There's a lot of domestic violence, a lot of crime. People are being placed into prison. They are, the society is crumbling. And they come to a decision that perhaps it is the alcohol and the alcoholism that's going across the country that is causing this chaos in the country. And then, from the Methodist Christian Church, they go to the government and say, yes, this is absolutely true. It is alcohol causing all these problems. So let's come together, let's agree, and let's put a ban on alcohol. What happens? They ban alcohol for about 13 years. In those 13 years, nobody is allowed to buy alcohol, sell alcohol, drink alcohol. If you're drunk, you get put in prison. Just being drunk. Imagine that was Sheffield Friday night. Just being drunk, they were put into prison. But the alcohol industry was huge, making billions and billions, even back then. So what happened as a result is people started making their own alcohol at home. They were bootlegging alcohol like you guys had the movies back in the day. And they were selling them. And what happened as a result is that now it's not only me and you selling alcohol in our own little home. 
It is somebody recognizing that all of these people, they want alcohol. How can we get it to the masses? Even the congressmen who made the decision to ban alcohol, most of them were drinking alcohol anyway. So what happened? The Al Capones of the world came about. He set up a huge conglomerate. Con 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 that word? That word? A huge one, setting alcohol up and down the country, and anybody else that takes his territory, what does he do? Sends his people after them. And what happened as a result? Now the people are drunk on the streets. Now they can't find the people who are selling the alcohol because they get shot. And on top of that, there's gang warfare that's in the heightened position that has ever been in the US. And eventually, 13 years later, they decide we made a bad decision. Let us go back to making alcohol lawful. And they're still struggling until today. However, in the 6th, 7th century, the Prophet وسلم, he came with a verse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that said mainly one word. Ijtahibu. Leave it. When he came to talk about alcohol. And there's a hadith of Anas where he says that I was in a house in a room where people were drinking alcohol, they're having their session, they're having their little gathering together. And somebody came to knock on our door and said that this verse has been sent down by Allah that says, Ijtanibu. Leave alcohol. And he says then the streets of Medina were flowing with alcohol. Everybody that had a barrel at home threw it out immediately. The ones who were in that gathering who just took a sip. They put their fingers down their throats to swap to, to vomit so that they can get whatever they just had, make it come out immediately. The whole of Medina could see the alcohol just going through like the rivers, and everybody surrendered and was in a state of acceptance that yes, if Allah says, then we shall leave it. This brings us to the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. In fact, talk to the one next to you. Why did, it, why did it succeed when it comes to, to, to when the Prophet وسلم, narrated the ayah to everybody and why did it fail when it came to the US? I'm going to give you like a minute and a half, speak to the one next to you and then I'm hoping, inshallah, I'll make dua in a minute and a half and you guys will answer my question. In the 1920s, You know a bit too much about this issue. <laughs> so the people who were making the legislation themselves weren't following what they were preaching. Yeah. Sisters, I'll go up there and then to you. Yes. Counterpoint. In the US, there were the people with the government and the police and so on. In Medina, it was the king of the government, the king of the police, who was asking them. Being Allah. Do you have a good point? Let's come to you, sister. Very good point. So they were already submitted to Allah, all they needed is that He tells them something and they'll be willing to obey. Yes. Um, I think it's sort of similar, the idea that if you're already buying into what the Catholic Council and stuff and stuff, but it's also the fact that it wasn't, okay, everyone is going to stop drinking alcohol right now. It was the fact that He introduced things a little better. Also, I think the first He said, um, it was um, announced that you can pray while you were drunk, but it slowly, slowly became more accepted. Okay. So there was a transition of change. Let me ask the brothers if you like the free now, no questions, no answers. I need to see hands. You're sitting next to the guy who's done his research. <laughs> Somebody at the top. We 
you were talking to your friends, right, about this? At least tell me what your friend said, not what you think. I'm a very patient man. I'm with you. I know a few of you are feeling bad for me. I can see on your faces. Come on, somebody. Yes, yeah, what are you were saying there, tell me. Yes, uh, you were feeling bad for me, but that's okay. Yes. Intent and relief. to the statement of Aisha radiallahu anha where she, and I paraphrase, she says that if the Quran and Revelation began with saying do not drink alcohol, do not fornicate then everybody will say we will drink alcohol and we will fornicate or rather the beginning of the Revelation was none of this the beginning of Revelation was to do with the hereafter was to do with the day of judgment was to do with the stories of the ones in the past was to do with asking them, reflect on what's around you. And if we were to generally look at the Meccan period, and we covered this two semesters ago, if we were to generally look at the Meccan period, there's no moment in time where Allah he will tell them, pray five times a day, go give charity, go fast. Allah doesn't make any of those claims and orders, no obligations upon the people. Even that, we, we mentioned this in our previous course, that there is somebody who gets the highest place, one of the highest places in Jannah, who never prayed a single Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, who never fasted the day of Ramadan, who never gave any zakah, who never followed the action or obligation of the hijab, but yet they get that highest place in Jannah. Who is this? Khadija. Khadija because she lived in the Meccan period, when none of this was legislated yet. And she died before the obligation of Salah had come. But yes, she got that status because what does Allah do during this period of time to the people? Allah is talking to their hearts. Allah is making their hearts and their souls submit. So that when the statement comes, do not drink alcohol, their hearts are already submitted. They're just waiting for an order and they are ready to obey. If their hearts were not submitted and the orders would have come, even Aisha anha says that the ones who were the people around her in Medina, the ones who we see as the great companions, they would not have submitted, they would not have accepted. And when we understand that spirituality, tezkiyah, purification is first changing the inward, once the inward has changed, then you will see the outward will then manifest in those good actions as well. We've seen, we've seen many a time in stories where somebody was the most hard-hearted person and he becomes Muslim. We see that in one day, and we see that in the story of Umar bin Khattab as well. And normally when we talk about the story of Umar, we say 
that he was softened by the recitation of the Qur'an. But the reality is, just before the Qur'an, there was something else that took place. Just before the Qur'an, there was moments in which Umar would go and listen to the Qur'an being recited and he would feel connected to it. There was moments before where he was once outside of Medina, outside of Mecca, and there was a family that were fleeing because they were going to be prosecuted the next day and punished and tortured and so on. They were fleeing to Abyssinia. And Umar he runs into them. He's not Muslim yet. He runs into them as they're fleeing. And he asks them, where are you going? Are you leaving your land? You're doing this, you're doing that. And they say, we're leaving the torture and the pain and the anguish that you give us to go somewhere where we can worship Allah. Now, Umar that we know, he would have chopped the heads off there and then. But in that moment, he says, and he smiles, and he says, have a safe journey. And in this conversation was a lady, and her husband was a bit further up. So she comes up and, and catches up with her husband and says, You would not believe what I just experienced today. I saw Umar al-Dillahman, and he told me, with a smile, have a safe journey. Perhaps you'll become Muslim. And the husband said, What are you, what are you missing about? No way. Umar, no chance. And all it took was maybe two, three days after that incident, that he goes with his sword in hand to the house of the Prophet ﷺ, on his way, being told that his own family has accepted Islam, goes to his house of the sister Fatima and he's angry still. And he's still upset. But then he, when he strikes her husband and he hits the sister a little bit and he sees blood, then what does the narration say? His heart was softened. This is before he's actually read the Quran. His heart is softened, and then he says, let me read the Qur'an, and she says, I'm not sure. And he says, trust me, I'm just going to read the Qur'an, I'm not going to do anything. I'm paraphrasing, this wasn't how they spoke. And then she says, go purify yourself, have a shower, and come back, and he reads. And then he reads, and he goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he knocks on the door. Umar radiallahu an, even in a state of now, I'm ready to become Muslim, when he knocks on the door, it's still like, <laughs> it's not one of those little knocks. And all the other sahaba sat down, and they're all, who's this? One of them goes to check and says, it's Umar. They all worry. Prophet Salam, he says, let me handle it. He gets up, goes to meet him himself. And imagine, this is Umar al-Dilaha. Prophet Salam, from this narration, we normally look at the strength of the Prophet. But let's also look at the heart of Umar al-Dilaha. He comes to him, and he holds him by his collar, and he brings him down to his knees. And he says, when will you accept this time? And he says, I'm ready. All of this is because his heart was softened before, Anything else. He hasn't prayed yet. He hasn't said, let me go and try two rakah and see what happens. He hasn't tried fasting one or two days and see what happens. He, his heart is the first thing that converted. When it did and it softened, then it was ready to accept everything else afterwards. That's why you have Musa ibn Umayr. He was in, in Mecca, the richest youngster around. The best shoes, the best clothes, the best perfume. Everything is custom made for him. Everybody knows him, he has loyalty, he has, he has all of this in, in, in Mecca. He accepts Islam, everything's taken away from him, and when he dies, he doesn't have enough to cover him. But what made him be able to leave the whole world behind? Even his mother said, that I will not have a shower, I'll stand outside in the sun for like days and days until you apostate and you leave Islam. And he says, it's not the first thing he says, but eventually he says this, he says that even if you were to do this multiple times, and you to lose your life and it comes back and you, I will still maintain on the religion of Islam. Because what changed for him? It was his heart before everything else. Allah told us in the ayah that I mentioned before, is the first thing that you would do is purify the inside, the spiritual element, then go into the actions. And if you were to look at the cycle of behavioral change, you will see that normally, when we look at seven habits of successful people, when we look at the art of change, when we look at all of these books, they cover the first element of saying, look at your environment. When we look at the youth and saying they're lost in the world, we say, look at their environment. Makes sense, right? If they move from one environment to the next, they'll be okay. If they move from Mecca to Medina, they'll be okay. But is it just a simple case of changing the environment to create the habit change? That doesn't always work that way. Even the guy who did 99 kills and killed 100 and so on, before he was told to move, he was told to seek forgiveness. And in his heart, know that Allah has accepted your, forgive, your, your seeking of forgiveness. 
then move. Because now your heart has been purified, now you'll do the action of moving to maintain that status of not falling into the same trap again and again and again. So the environment on its own doesn't do the work. Neither does behavior. Somebody asks you why are you doing it and how are you doing it and starts telling you to do it this way, do it that way. It helps, but it doesn't make a long lasting change. Then it comes to the psychological side. Understanding how you feel when you do certain things. Having that conversation with yourself. Why did the person do this? Because you didn't understand what they were saying, you didn't put yourself in their shoes, you didn't understand where they were coming from. All of this makes sense. But this will be a short change that you will make. How many of us have decided one day that I'm going to be one of those morning people? I'm going to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning, I'm going to run for an hour, then go to the gym for three hours, and then somehow it's still 6 o'clock in the morning, then I'm going to eat all the protein I need, then I'm going to pray Fajr. I missed the yam, but it's okay. Pray Fajr. Then I'm going to do my university work in the morning because Allah says, the Prophet Sallam says that the morning time is the blessed time. Then I'm going to go to university. I'm, I'm ahead of everybody. You did that for one day, two days, three days, four, maybe five, let's say three weeks. And then you gave up. Those three weeks were am amazing. But then your excuse, I burnt out, I tried too hard, I ran too much, I, all of these things. And what do you do to try to make that happen? You set like 10 alarms. You have like a chat that has like this system somehow. And he gets poked in the morning and screams and shouts at you. you. You wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is answer a math riddle or something before you even come out of your bed. You try everything. What have you done? You focus on your environment. You focus on your behavior. And you focus on your psychology. It's like, you know, all the books tell you the one who wakes up in the morning, successful people, all this. You focus, but what have you missed out? And this is where Islam focuses a lot on. On your missions, your values, your purpose, and your core identity. All of this goes back, in simple terms, back to your a servant of Allah in this world, worshipping Allah, spending your time here so that you can attain the greater success, which is paradise. This is the simplest form. And then imagine every single action you do has that core principle, then when they are told, don't drink alcohol, we're not thinking about the alcohol, nor the buzz, nor the camaraderie, nor the laughs and jokes, and we see the guy walking into the wall all the time, we laugh at him. Now we're thinking, how are we going to make sure we get to Jannah? Does it mean I need to leave this? I'm ready. And in every behavioral change, as a Muslim, you need to start there. And I can tell you, when I was at university, I had the misfortune, or the fortune, to be the head of my ISOC. And we had a lot of people coming to us saying, we need therapy, we need counseling, do you have anybody you can refer us to, we need to speak to someone. So I went to the university counsellors as a, uh, uh, an informant. So I went in, I took one of the cases that I got, and I went in, shed a few tears, told them my story. And what I was trying to get at is to understand, because as Muslims we have an element or behavioral change that is not covered when it comes to modern day psychology and counseling. Where I would have the conversation saying, oh, I keep failing my exams and I don't know what's going on and I'm waking up in the morning and I'm doing my routine and I do everything and I can tell you the answers right now. Oh, that conversation I can have. And then they all tell me, okay, why don't you try this? Why don't you try it, buddy? Why don't you try that? And, why? and then I would tell them, you know, I would, I'm doing all of that, but what I'm finding is one of the reasons is when I go and pray to Allah, to give me success in my exam, I don't actually believe my dua. Leave that one. Do this. Try this one. Try this. But um, my problem is not the exam. My problem is when I'm going to Allah and I'm asking him a question, I feel like he's not going to answer my question. What's wrong with me? Leave that alone. Focus on this element. You study harder. Take my notes. I'll find you a friend if I ask it your exam. And that's not answering my question. A similar conversation that I had with multiple of them. And they can answer everything until when it comes to that element. Even when I say, for example, I'm trying to make a decision while my family is saying this and somebody else is saying that, and then I come to pray istikhara prayer. I'm not saying I'm praying istikhara prayer. I'm saying I'm doing my due diligence and I'm asking the questions, I'm doing everything. But I can't come to that decision. And then I come, come, come. Let's do pros and cons. I've already done this. No, no, do it again. You missed something out. Everything is covered. No, no, just try it out. Maybe you need to find an expert in your field. Yeah, I do. This scholar, 
There's a doctor of the heart and the cardiologist, the other doctor of the heart. Now, there's nothing wrong with the behavior change. There's nothing wrong with the environment change. There's nothing wrong with understanding the psychological change, but if you want long-lasting change, as you can see from the companions compared to those in the US, you need to sort out your core values, your missions, and your purpose. If we were to look at these two examples, Prophet ﷺ had a man come to him and say the same thing you're telling me, and I'm telling you. Saying, I feel like my heart is very hard. What should I do? The Prophet ﷺ says, if you want to soften your heart, go and feed the poor and tap the heads of the orphans. What are we taking away from this? Firstly, the Sahaba had the same problem that we had. Secondly, Prophet Sallallahu he gave them a practical action to do. When we talk about tazkiyah, when we talk about spirituality and purification, we need to recognize this is not sitting like this for hours and hours and hours and hours and hopefully something happens. This is, you need to do an action for something to instigate something else, for, to instigate something else, and an action is not always going to give the poor. Because there's loads of people in the world giving the poor. But if you're connecting that to my heart, I'm going to feed a poor person with the idea that I've got a problem with my heart, what happens? You actually see their poverty and you don't see, look at me. Everybody else at home eating their KFC. I'm sat here giving, what do you guys like to eat in Sheffield? Imran's. Imran's. Should we put unit for a little while? <laughs> so all of these foods that you would find to be good, you're saying, look, everyone's doing that, but look at me. I'm feeding the poor person some dal and some rice and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Right? You're giving yourself all the, the comeuppance. But the, rea the reality is that somebody who goes to feed the poor, because their heart is hard, they will say, look what Allah has given them and look what Allah has given me. They will say, look at the opportunity that I get that loads of people are missing out on. They will say that, you see that smile that that person has? I hope one day I can smile like that. I have everything I need. But that person is able to smile in a way that I can't smile. Right? What happens in this process? Your heart is feeling a sense of softness. And in another narration, a man comes to the Prophet and he asks him, what is this purification of the soul? And the Prophet he says very simply, to know that Allah is with you wherever you are. Imagine that, when the Prophet is in the cave of Abu Bakr and he says that if they just look down, they'll find us, he says, what, what do you think of two? And the third one is Allah. This is when somebody is in the heightened level of spirituality, where their heart is in a good place, recognizing that Allah is always seeing them, always aware of them. I don't mean in the, in, in the sense of surveillance. I mean in the sense of holding you in His candor and care. In your, in your need, He is there. I'm not going to continue my rhyme. Okay, I want to ask you guys a question now. From your understanding, is there a difference between the Western version of a human being and the Islamic version of a human being? And if so, I want you to identify a few of them. Please talk to your enemy next to you and then tell me the answers in a few minutes, inshallah. <coughs> Let's bring the discussion back, inshallah. This time we'll start with the sisters and hopefully the brothers get the courage to raise their hands, inshallah. Okay, tell us why. Well, what's the difference between the Western idea of the human being and the Islamic? Yes. Um, the Western idea of the human being is that the So the West are just looking at themselves and Islam has a more holistic view of themselves, community and Allah as well. Good. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, so everything is built for the hereafter while the Western human being is built for this world. Okay, good. Yes, the top.
for the Western, they don't have a method of following a rulership other than their own. They decide their own laws and follow them. They're making them sound like barbarians. <laughs> Let me go to the left. Let me go to the brothers. Yes. What do we have? Yes, great. And stand inside with the wolves? So it's more we care about what we do to Allah, okay. not so much what others do. Okay, so the Western model is looking at what, how we can appease other people, and the Islamic model is we're looking at how we can please Allah. Good. Anything else? I'd like the brothers in the back. And the brothers in the front too. Yes. Um, you were talking about how the Western uh, like perception of the human being is you have to look up to your, yourself mentally and physically. Okay. Whereas Islamically, you understand that we have to look up to ourselves mentally and physically, and we have a third aspect which is spiritual and as well. Perfect. So the Western side have the mental and physical, and the Islamic side have the addition of spiritual. Yes. In the Western idea of life is you constantly have to chase, chase after the next thing. Okay. But from the Western perspective, you have, you have to have an idea of contentment and then kind of if you're still progressing, you're still content in that part. Okay, good. So in the Western view, you're always chasing the next big thing. In the Islamic view, is that you should have a sense of contentment with what you have. But I will say we always have one big thing that never changes that we're chasing. Yes. Okay. Good. So if you're referring to the fifth one, our natural inclination towards worshipping Allah and so on. And in the Western world they're trying to find what that is. Sure. Let's go here. And then here. And then which brothers can you give me an answer? Okay. So West individual, Islam community. Yes. Could you add like um, superficial versus intent? So in like Islam, where it's, it's not saying that everyone is like this, but in Islam it's pushed to have good intention in everything you do, not just with like religious aspects, with people and people around you. Whereas in Western, it's just like they just not everyone as well. Some people do do good things with good intent, but a lot of the times it does feel superficial. Okay. Okay. So higher intention. I'll put it that way. Yes. You had your hand raised. Yes. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Okay. So the Western world is where I can give and take, and the Islamic world it has a higher purpose. Okay, one, one thing I'll, I'll just make on that point. She mentioned that worship Allah, that's our main purpose, and we eat and drink. Okay, okay because our eating and drinking is also worshipping. Okay, good. Good, good. Okay, thank you, thank you. I think I need to ask you guys to talk to your enemies a bit more often. There's a lot of words up here, some of you may recognize them, some of you may not. I want you to think about it in the way that I tell you to think about it. Okay? Don't look at this, don't get fixated on the words and so on. I want to keep it very, very simple. 
if you were to look at the Western model, they would always look at the human being from a behavioral perspective to a cognitive perspective to if they're feeling generous, the emotional perspective. And in Islam, we look at the behavior, we look at the cognition, we look at the emotion, but then we also have the spiritual state as well. So if you were to imagine the human being that's walking around on the stage right now, you would see the body, which will be the self. What you see as me and you hear my voice and everything, you will consider this to be Muhammad. But then there's a deeper sense of me that's more than just the self that you can see. And that deeper sense is my intellect. The deeper sense is my heart and my soul. And I want the purpose for our course is not to have a philosophical discussion with you but rather to tell you when we're talking about the heart and the soul, we're talking about one thing. And if you want to go a bit deeper, let's just say that the heart is when the soul is inside your body, and the ruh, when we're just talking about the soul, is when it's outside your body. So when you're asleep, you're in between. When you were before the existence of this world, you were your soul, but it was the same soul. After, the, after you leave this world, you still remain to be your soul. But when it's placed inside a being, then for our intents and purposes, this is the heart. So whenever we talk about the soul and the heart, we're talking about one entity. We're not talking about the beating heart itself, but we're talking about the entity of the heart that has where the emotions are, it has where the decision making is, it has where your purpose lies. Your purpose is not here. Somebody could ask somebody, why do you exist? And they can give you the best essay that you could ever imagine with the most fascinating words but the heart doesn't believe the same the mind is able to conjure up some beautiful words but the heart doesn't believe the same then you can ask someone who only speaks sign language not because they can't speak because they were never taught anything else and you can ask them why do you exist and they could just give you like one of these and that is more powerful than the one who wrote the full essay because this was what his heart was saying the other one is what the intellect was saying and in our course, we're focusing on the heart element. You will experience the rest in your life as well. You'll have people pulling at everything else as well. But the element that we keep forgetting and we keep neglecting because we don't feel it physically is the heart and the soul. And if you remember, the home of trial and tribulations is the heart, stroke soul. And the, heart, the home of happiness is also the heart, stroke the soul as well. So in very simple terms, the mind is the neurons and stuff in your head that process everything that you see. But it's not the decision maker. It's actually the heart that is the decision maker. The body is what carries out the instructions of not the mind, in science it's the minds and the neurons and all of that. But in our conversation, it's not the mind, it's the heart that instructs the body to do what it does. And then the heart and the soul is one entity that is the core of the human being that remains from before they came to this world to after they leave this world as well. If you start asking me more questions about the, the soul, I will tell you. They ask you about the soul. Say that the ruh is from the knowledge or the ability of my Lord. This is the ayah in the Quran. But for your intents and purposes, understand, we're going to talk about the heart and the soul throughout this entire course. We're talking about that one entity that is your decision maker, that is your purpose aligner, that is your behavior, that is your character, that's actually your soul and your heart. I think last week we kind of made this point clear. That our heart and soul has things pulling at it left, right and center. And I'm not going to make you talk to your enemy today anymore. I'm just going to give you to shout out answers. What would be things that will tug at your soul and your heart? Sins. Sins. Calamities. Calamities. Gratitude. Commitments. Gratitude. Gratitude, good. Company. C company. Sure. Temptations, celebrations, guilt. guilt, good. The heartless guys in the back. <laughs> Sorry, I'm picking you. Okay, if 
to put it very simply, you have your own personal desires to make yourself feel happy and good that will pull you down, and you have shaitan that will pull you down. And the thing that pulls you up is Allah, is Quran, is remembrance, is all of those things. Those things include kindness, include charity, include smiling, things at the bottom that are tugging you down, include anger, include foul language, include all of those things. Our heart is in a constant tug of war between these two elements. And that's why there's an element of the heart which is taqwa, reliance upon Allah. And when you're at home, essentially at home you should be in your comfort place. Everything should be relaxed, everything should be easy. You, can't, you don't need to worry about all the calamities on the outside world. You have your roof over your head. I know sometimes this isn't the case, but that's what the home is supposed to be. Then when you step out of the home, Allah tells us through the Prophet ﷺ saying, Bismillah, tawakkaltu ala Allah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Say in the name of Allah, I leave everything in the hands of Allah, and I don't need anybody, Allah is sufficient for me. And what are you doing in this process? You're saying that the rest of the world has that tug of war that's happening with me. It's pulling me from one sin to the next, pulling me from an opportunity to the next, pulling me from even physical danger. But I want Allah to protect me. What does Allah say, the Prophet say about the one who reads this? One of two things. In one hadith, you have an angel that has a banner, pretty much says, this guy is under my protection, until you come back home. And another hadith, that there will be a shaitan that will say, that what do you think of somebody who is protected and guided and taken care of? How can I delude him? The other shaitan said, you can't do anything, just go into the next street. Again, I'm paraphrasing, this is not how they talk. But the idea still remains that your heart is being pulled left, right and center and unless you submit that heart to Allah in those cases, then you'll be always dragged to the wrong places. But when you submit it to the right places, it'll be always lifted to back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is where the home of happiness is. Now, I'll let you guys just look at this beautiful graphic at home. Take it in. We understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says كَلَّا بَلْ رَاهَنَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ uh, uh, We had a student that was reciting Quran with us and our teacher asked, what's your favorite ayah? And he says, I love كَلَّا بَلْ رَاهَنَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ My teacher is about to cry. Because this is talking about, verily, there's those people who get those hearts that are hardened. Like a guaranteed harden. Allah is not saying it is like in between, that they have moments of heart. No, this is like a heart that has the upped amount of hardness around it. Because of what they used to do. So it's directly linked to our actions, what we did with our eyes and ears and mouth and limbs and so on. And when you are left with a hard heart, you are constantly distracted by everything else in the world. Even when you're doing the righteous things, you're distracted by everything else. Even when somebody comes and gives you a compliment, uh, he's got something in mind. It wasn't for me, it was for something else. Constantly distracted. Always living like you are under attack. Somebody with a hard heart, even though you would say in beautiful words that I'm worshipping Allah and this is my existence and so on, but if you were to truly examine yourself, you would realize that you don't have any meaning in life. That you would have no impact of any reminder, somebody nudges you and says, don't do this, I'm okay. Nothing impacts you. That your prayers are pretty much not there. That you are unable to let go of bad things. That you get in the cycle of sin and you start wondering, why can I not get out? And then eventually, this is where I am. I'm not, I don't plan to go anywhere else. I'm happy where I am. That you get easily tempted by other things as well and you get obsessed with everything to do with the world. When we talk about the West and we talk about the Islamic mindset, we sometimes fall into the Western mindset of chasing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing because we only see that as our form of comfort and ease, thinking that this is what will remove those hardness around our heart. Then you have the other guy. May Allah make us amongst those who have softened hearts, content souls. Every time somebody gives you a reminder, you benefit from it. Sometimes you would see somebody across the street do something to somebody else across the street and you benefited from it. How many times have you heard the parable of you walking in the street and there was a rock in the road and you were busy 
distracted by the world and you missed it and you kept going and then you turned around and you saw somebody come and picked it up and put it on the side that could have been me. Right? Somebody's heart has contempt. They have softened. Every opportunity it sees, it will seize those opportunities. That heart that is content will have a conversation with Allah as if Allah is responding to them immediately. As if Allah is telling them, don't worry, you got it answered. I, I remember, I don't know where I heard this, but I heard a story of there was a group that went for Umrah and amongst them was a new Muslim. He's recently accepted Islam. He's still working up how do I make dua. And he says, I stood in front of the Kaaba and I was asking Allah and I genuinely felt. I asked for a car, I felt like Allah said, it's yours. I asked for a pair of shoes, Allah says it's yours. I asked for my family to accept Islam, Allah said, he literally felt, he came out from that conversation to say to everybody, did you guys hear what I heard? Everyone was like, what are you talking about? But this is when your heart is content, you feel a deeper connection to Allah. Because if you can imagine when the Sahaba are sat on their horses and the camels, and their shoe comes untied, on their camel, they're asking Allah, should I tie my shoe, should I not? And Allah will give them an inspiration to say yes or no. And they'll act upon it immediately. With Allah and the ones that have hardened hearts. Whether you understand the Quran or not, somebody who has a deeper connection like that, they will be impacted. By a reminder, by the Quran, by their own recitation, by anything. Anything that is good, they'll have that connection and impact. They constantly are in a state of remembering Allah when you stood your toe. You don't say what you said earlier today. You say something else. In remembrance of Allah. When you're praying, you're praying with focus, you have a constant sense of gratitude. You know when I told you I went to those psychologists and counselors and had a conversation, and they were telling me that, you know, look on the bright side, what are you grateful for? And I was saying, oh, I'm grateful for my parents and my shoes and my house and everything, and, and I'm grateful for my for Allah. That, leave that one. No, give me, give me material, what else are you, I'm telling you I'm grateful. No, no, leave that, put that one to the side. What are you really grateful for? And you know when you, when you, are grateful to Allah truly, then your gratitude conversation about your shoes and your family and everything is directly linked to Allah. And imagine you're having that conversation. You know when you have a conversation with a parent that, you know, you, you didn't never really talk to them like this, but one day you're just like, you know, you guys are so nice to me. You've done this and you've done this and you've done this. And what do they usually tell us as Muslim parents? It wasn't me. Right? I did this much. Allah did all that. Right? It's not because they're being humble. Because at that point, they actually recognize that yes, we struggle and we strive and we worked 10 jobs and we did all of these things. And, but in reality, what we got in return was not what I did. What my son and my daughter being able to pray was not because I worked 10 jobs. Allah did that part. That time where he almost ran into the road and got hit by a car and some random person pulled it. Wasn't that a random person? Yes, you show gratitude to a random person. But you also then go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And somebody who has that deep cleanse, cleansing of the heart, they are able to associate everything back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not lip service, but reality. Uh, your behaviors will conform to revelation, like I mentioned in the story of alcohol. You will avoid sins and at least become self-aware. A lot of us might fall in the cycle that at one point we knew that this was wrong. And then now we've been doing it for a while, and now, while we're doing it, we don't recognize that it's wrong. We'll be going through whatever the sin is, we'll be doing it, and then maybe like a year later, we'll recognize, oh, I made a mistake, and yeah, Allah to forgive. Ramadan comes around, well, I, I, I have been making a mistake this whole time. But somebody whose heart is like this, they will make mistakes. But in the moment of the mistake, and immediately after, they'll recognize that they're making a mistake, and they will ask forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lastly, you will actively pursue the pleasure of Allah. I don't remember which lesson, but we ended one of our lessons in the past by giving you the story of the moment where Allah says, I am pleased with you. And you hear him say it. It's not the guy who was standing at the Kaaba. You hear Allah telling you that I am pleased with you. That is the greatest joy that you would feel up until that moment while you're in paradise. And the one whose heart is as clean as possible, as soft as possible, will look for every opportunity to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like you want to please your father-in-law and your mother-in-law, you do the best that you can. If you remember, we mentioned when the Prophet was asked about what's purification of the heart, is to know that Allah is aware of you, is watching you, is seeing you all the time. 
may Allah grant us this uh, purity of heart. I have a moment of introspection. Don't talk to your enemy or your friend. Think by yourself and as honestly as you can, hide your phones, don't let them see your answers. Where would you place your current heart on the spectrum of zero being the hardest of hearts to ten being, inshallah, a good, content, soft heart? And one potential reason as to why. There's a big question at the end, there's only three letters, it's called why. At least think why. Don't, don't write why. Please just think, think as to why. The ones who are reading others' answers are not writing their own. My hope is that you had a moment of reflection and you recognize and are assessing yourself as to where you are, where you are. And by the end of this course, I want to ask you that same question. And everything that you guys have mentioned as to why you feel where you are on that spectrum, there should be an elevation because most of the things I saw that was written, we are covering an element of those over the next eight weeks or so. But then it's your duty to say, okay, I'll take what's being said and apply it to myself and not apply it to the one next to me or the one at home or the one that I see on the street, but apply it to yourself. And if you're finding yourself, the moment of transformation is not one moment in life. Allah, he says in the ayah that I refer, recited right in the beginning, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى Allah, he says that the ones who are truly successful are not the ones who have reached this high level of tazkiyah, purification, and they're living in the clouds. He's not talking about them. He's saying the ones who are in a cycle of purification, of finding their spirituality, and are working on it on a constant basis. Those are the ones that attain that success. But we need to be able to work on it ourselves. And I showed you this cycle before, but very simply put, we are going to look at everything to make yourself self-aware as to why you are where you are, how you're going to cleanse that, and it always begins with seeking forgiveness. And then how are you going to nourish your soul now? Now you saw forgiveness, how are you going to feed your soul? And then how are you going to maintain some medicine that you take on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, to make sure you don't fall back into finding where you fell wrong. And you'd go in the cycle and everything that we cover. And hopefully you can find why you're doing what you're doing, how you can get rid of it initially, how you can then put the white polish around your heart, and then how you can maintain it afterwards, inshallah. Prophet Sallallahu is somebody who is free of all wrongdoings. But he had a great concern of his own heart. And his most frequent supplication to Allah was Ya Muqallib al-Qulub Thabit Qalbi ala deenik I'm not going to say what it says here. I'm going to say, O oh, turner of hearts. Make my heart steadfast on your religion. Imagine this is not the dua that he made one time in his life. 
On the dua, when things got really bad, he made that dua. This is a statement that he would make most frequently in his life. Because he recognizes himself that the state of the heart can be turned in any moment in time. And this should be seen first as a glad tiding. If your heart is at minus one, so I'm put minus one, that was on the spectrum. Allah can twist that and take it to mind in a moment. But also for the ones who feel like I'm good, I'm at nine, I'm at eight, then recognize that it just takes a moment and Allah can take it back to one and two. And this means that we need to be in a constant cycle of working on our heart, recognizing where we are, nourishing the soul, finding that deep cleanse, and knowing what our spiritual medicine is. You know how we talk about languages of love, and everybody has a different one? Everybody also has a different spiritual medicine. And you need to identify what they are for you at this moment in time. It, will, it may change as well. But you need to identify what it is, and then you need to apply it to yourself in your days. And one thing that I would like for you to leave today with is be very, very introspective. Try to find one element of your character that you know you are falling short on and try to think of what you might do to rectify that one character trait of yours. And if you come across a character trait along the way, you've had this in the back of your mind since day one. And when you see it being hit on the head, you say, that's me, then you know how to turn it around as well. Before we and in there, there will be some clues to verify as to why and how your intention is pure. But mostly, it is either questioning yourself or seeing how other people question you. If you were to just look at those two elements, you'll find an indication as to where your heart is in terms of intention. And you always will pray that Allah gives you the purest of intentions because we can always fall short. It just takes a moment in our life that we'll fall short. So we still need to pray that Allah gives us the most purest of intentions. Connecting with Allah with your soul, I think that was a connection, that was an answer to your question. Can we have the Dalil of Umar's encounter with the people? Uh, I'll get somebody, with the, yeah, okay. I'll get someone to share it onto the music group. Shall I'll find it and I'm going to share it. Uh, for not praying, there's another answer. Um, whoever wants access to the PowerPoint, you will get the workbooks next week, inshallah, if the couriers are sensible. Uh, they will have most, like 90% of what's on the slides. So inshallah you will get it through there. Uh, why is the message from the person who does sign language seen as more meaningful than the one who wrote it? Both are coming from the brain. They are. They are both coming from the brain. But what I was identifying is not necessarily the conversation that they were both having, but sometimes it's not the words that would make something meaningful or not. It's more so the state of the heart. So in our eyes, sometimes we might look at the one who has written a long essay, but his heart is not actually there, he just found the nice words, looked for synonyms and put them together, and made a statement. While the other one who was unable to make a statement, but yet was able to show his connection to Allah and his reasoning and his purpose in this world, then perhaps that person has shown more meaning in his sign language than the one who has written a lot. It is equally possible that somebody can write a lot and be in the same status as somebody who has not been able to say a single word. But the point I was highlighting is that it's not necessarily using your mind to make a statement, it is using the heart to make a statement. Four, three. Okay. Is there a certain part of the Quran that you can read to cleanse your heart, your soul? I think generally is the entire Quran. I, could, I wouldn't say one, but I will say, like I said earlier about spiritual medicine, that everybody might find a portion of the Quran that they connect to more than anything else. So like the... Uh, the easy ones are Surah Yusuf, Surah Kahf, Surah Yasin, Surah Maryam, Ayat al-Kursi, Surah Al-Baqarah. These are the easy ones, to just name a few. But the reality is, somebody could just go to another, another random surah, and just one day the Ilafi Quraysh is hitting them in the heart. So it is not an area of the Qur'an particularly, but if I was to talk thematically, I would say the Meccan Qur'an, which is about the hereafter, about Jannah, Jahannam, about the people of the past, and it's the questions to you. Do you not see the sky? Do you not see the earth? Allah, me. No, that's, a, that's a machine. But Allah is asking us to look at the things around us and reflect and say who is creating these things, who is able to do these things. And you come to the conclusion that it's none but Allah. 
So in terms of themes, Mecca and Quran, I will say. Uh, it's not possible to be 10 out of 10, I don't think. There is always more we can do. How do we prevent arrogance and keep working on ourselves? I think that, that's the mentality of not being 10 out of 10. The mentality of understanding the Prophet was worried about his heart. Umar was worried about his heart, Abu Bakr was worried about his heart. The ones who we see as elite, they're worried about their heart. And these same people will come on the Day of Judgment and they'll be worried about their heart as well. There is, here's, here's some spiritual food for you. On the Day of Judgment, this hadith of the Prophet on the Day of Judgment, everybody who is stood there in hellfire will be brought in front of everyone. And it will have 70,000 chains attached to it. Each chain is held by 70,000 angels. And when the Prophet ﷺ describes this, hellfire is not coming like a little bowl or a pit of fire. It's coming like a raging beast. And it has eyes that can see. And hellfire, will, whoever it locks its eyes with on that day, in that moment, will know that they are destined for the fire. And as the Prophet ﷺ was narrating this, he turned to Umar Dillahman and he says, Oh Umar, know that even the one who comes on that day with, with deeds the equivalent of 70 prophets, they will be worried that the hellfire will be looking at them. And they'll be asking Allah, Allah protect us from the fire. Allah protect us from the fire. So if we can imagine that those people, I'm not 70 prophets kind of guy. I'm barely half, barely a third. Very intent. If those people be worried then, then how can we even think about having a sense of arrogance that I am 9.9 .9 out of 10? We, we couldn't imagine that at all. Uh, can we have Dalil of Okay, I'll put, I'll put that in the group. Why do you suggest for people, what do you suggest for people who are unable to stop thinking about others, other unnecessary things? I was praying. Uh, I don't know what state of prayer you are at at the moment. But when it comes to prayer, sometimes it's focusing on just one thing. When we were young, like five, ten years old, didn't know what the guys, imams were reciting, didn't know surah, didn't understand a word. We were just told, think about your palace in Jannah. That lasted for like a day. And then, there, then they were told, uh, think about uh, protection from hellfire. That lasted like half a prayer. I don't like hellfire thinking. Then we're told about the grave. And then what you're doing in that process is that you're taking one element and you're focusing on that. And then when that gets a little bit normal, then you go to the next element. And if I could go specifically just to prayer itself, that one element could be Allah. You're just focusing on, I'm saying Allah. Allah is the greatest. In fact, Allah is greater than, and then you add, complete that sentence every time you say it. And then you read Fatiha and that becomes your focus. Have you ever heard an Imam who starts Fatiha by saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Has he forgotten Ar Rahman Ar Rahim? But he's having that moment in which he's focusing on that element and he's having a sense of gratitude. He just takes that one, just focus on one thing. And then focus on, you know when you're in your record and your knees are buckling and your legs are like shaking a little bit? You can just focus on that and say, look how weak I am. I'm actually in a state and I'm saying, how glorious is Allah, the mighty. Look how weak I am, I can barely just bend over. And then focus on sujood. Look at the state of humility I am in. I wouldn't do this in front of anybody else in the world. Just focusing on one element. I don't know what stage of prayer the questioner is at, but if you could just focus on one element at a time, you will see, inshallah, your prayer will grow and grow and grow. And if you fall short, it's okay. But your intention should be, let me try again, and try again, and try again. Keep knocking on that door. This is a weekly session. Yes, it is. And it is at the same time, inshallah. So 7 p.m., same time, same room, same place. Mostly in the same speaker. Yes. Um, I had a question about teaching others. So are we equipped, you know, to do things that we can't Go to the recording first and then if they have questions. No, I'll say in, in an informal setting, everybody that hears any form of reminder, 
they should be able to take it, apply it to themselves first, and then remind somebody else. But in terms of taking them on a journey and doing it, so I would not suggest it. I would suggest it. Because I can tell you, for us setting this thing up, we have gone through this like six times in the last three months. We got rid of everything, started again. Did it. And it was just research and reading books and so on. So what we are summarizing for you here is like uh, thousands of hours of work. So I, I wouldn't say that you, can, you're, you are in a position to take it and pass it on in the way that we are giving it. But comfortably, there are points, there are sections, there are lessons, there are these. You can always, always. In fact, try your best to do so after applying it to yourself. Any question? Any other questions in the room? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, is it okay to take part of dissection standards? Uh, can I come back to you? Whoever asked that question, can I come back? Uh, I'm assuming that's yes. I'll, uh, let me verify. Can, uh, if you want to keep it anonymous, can you tell me what type of dissection we're talking about here? Probably human dissection in medicine. I need to ask the question. Probably. Yeah, but uh, are we talking about like a, like a animal's heart or something? Or? No, like body, human. Like you cut people open. To do the surgery? No, no to look no. at them. Oh, to just to like investigate. Heart. Put your head in and see what's going on. It's like how we learn like to do yeah. Do they do that with real bodies? Yeah, 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 you get a real person. Okay. I mean, I, I remember in my university, I used to go to this room that had beautiful clay human beings that were just, it's like in China, you know, that was mortifying. But I, I'll verify that, inshallah, and I'll, I'll answer it properly. Okay. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, inshallah, alhamdulillah, 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 al